And there's a whole story about how that's happened, how uh, the big meatpacking plants broke unions. Um, crucial to that story was the ability to uh, replace workers relatively easily, and that's, it seems as if it's also crucial to why those wages are staying low today. Uh, we found that, that after major uh, ICE uh, investigations at some of the meatpacking plants, finding that hundreds of workers at some of these plants were, were, um, were illegal workers, uh, when they were taken out of the workforce, uh, wages rose very quickly at those plants because the owners needed to, to get them going again quickly. And so they, they spent the money to make that happen. So uh, long-term unemployment among poorer Americans has been greatly increased as uh, new jobs have been filled by immigrants rather than, been than by unemployed citizens. So mass immigration isn't the sole cause of these trends of, of increased inequality and, and uh, lower opportunities, but it seems to have played an important role. Harvard's George Borjas contends that during the 1970s and 1980s, each immigration-driven 10% increase in the number of workers in a particular field in the U.S. decreased wages in that field by an average of 3.5%. Uh, more recently, there was a study done by a team that looked at the impact of immigration on African Americans, and it found that a 10% uh, a immigrant-induced increase in the supply of a particular skill group reduced the wages of black workers in that group by 4% and lowered the, uh, the employment rate of black men in that skill group by 3.5%. And there are other similar studies that have been done in recent years. In contrast, wealthier, better educated citizens have mostly been spared that kind of strong downward pressure on their incomes, at least so far. So according to an analysis by CIS, Immigrants account for, today, account for 35% of workers in building, cleaning, and maintenance, but only 10% in the corporate and financial sectors. Uh, they account for about 25% of workers in construction, but only 8% of teachers and college professors. So, you know, meat packers might be making 44% less than they did in 1970, but medical doctors are making more than twice as much. Again, not all of that can be laid at the door of immigration, but some of it seemingly can. By flooding labor markets and undermining our society's commitment to a fair distribution of wealth, mass immigration has contributed significant, significantly to increased economic inequality in the U.S. And my argument, most simply, is that this should matter to political progressives. In an era of, of gross and growing economic inequality, stagnating wages, persistently high unemployment among less educated workers, um, we should resist any policy that makes all of this worse. So just as with proposals to further liberalize trade policies, it should raise a red flag for progressives uh, when Democratic political leaders join the, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the Wall Street Journal advocating for, for higher immigration levels. Turning now to the environmental side, the key issue is really immigration's contribution to U.S. population growth. If they think about population growth at all, uh, most Americans think about it as an issue for the developing world. But with a population of 320 million people, the United States is the third most populous nation in the world. And that population is growing at a quite rapid rate, about 1% annually. If you project that out, that means we're set to double our population in about 20 years. That's higher, actually, than, than many developing nations today. So given our already high population and uh, given our, our high rates of resource consumption, you could make a pretty good case that the U.S. is the most uh, overpopulated country in the world right now. Whether we look at air pollution or wildlife habitat losses, greenhouse gas emissions, or excessive water withdrawals from western rivers, Americans are falling far short of creating a sustainable society now. And our large and growing numbers seem to be a big part of this problem. In my book, I, I detail this for a whole range of environmental issues, ranging from suburban sprawl to uh, species extinction. And overall, what I find, pretty unsurprisingly, is that more people put 
greater stress on natural systems and make it harder to share habitat and resources fairly with, with other species. Now, the good news is that in recent decades, American citizens have freely chosen a path toward population stabilization. So if you look at fertility rates in the U.S. in the 1950s, American women on average were having about three and a half children per person. Uh, today, American women are choosing to have about two children per, per woman. And so that's right around replacement rate for um, a modern society with, with uh, modern sanitation and medical care. That means if we reduced immigration rates to the levels of 50 years ago, America's population would very likely peak and then stabilize by about mid-century. So that's, that's the good news. We've freely chosen to stabilize our population, which is one key component to creating an ecologically sustainable society. The bad news is that just as Americans have chosen to do this, uh, succeeding Congresses have chosen to increase immigration, thus keeping our population on a path, uh, our country on a path of rapid population growth. In the book, I, I actually run some new population projections out to 2100, uh, taking a standard Census Bureau figures for mortality rates and uh, fertility rates. And I, I run different, uh, different population projection scenarios with different immigration levels. So at, at our current immigration rate of about one and a quarter million annual, um, and, and running this out to 2100, our population increases from about 320 million to 525 million. That's, that's a, an immense increase in just two, two and a half generations. Um, and you might ask, well, how much of a difference would changing immigration rates be given that, that uh, you're talking about relatively small annual changes, a million up or a million, a million down? Well, it turns out that for every extra half million people you bring into the United States annually, uh, and if you do that over the rest of the, the century, that leads to 72 million more citizens in the United States in 2100. That's sort of a ballpark way to think about it. So for instance, uh, we're on track to increase our population to about 525 million. If we had gone ahead and passed the Gang of Eight immigration bill from the last Congress, that might have increased immigration to about two and a quarter million annually. And that would have led instead to an increase to 670 million Americans in 2100. Now conversely, if you cut back immigration, if you reduced it to the levels of 50 years ago, so let's say you reduced immigration to about a quarter million annually, you would instead have a population in 2100 of about 380 million. So that's, and it would stabilize. So, I mean, that's just a huge difference. Again, that should make a difference to, uh, to environmentalists who are concerned about creating an ecologically sustainable society. And I should emphasize that, that if we continue on a path of population growth, uh, even if we could manage to, to sort of stumble to 2100 with 500 million or 600 million or 700 million Americans, we'd be on a very unpromising trajectory of continued population growth. So fortunately, such overpopulation uh, like flooded labor markets isn't inevitable. Americans can stabilize our population by reducing immigration, not, not ending immigration, but simply reducing it. And that in turn could help revitalize an environmental movement that kind of like organized labor is mostly in a, in a defensive crouch these days, fending off bad proposals uh, and, and sort of trying to protect past accomplishments instead of achieving new ones. So if you imagine an environmental movement with a demographic wind at its back, I think it would be much more likely to secure the reductions in greenhouse gas emissions that we'd like to secure, much more likely to create new national parks and protected areas, and, and in general, much more likely to do the things that we think are necessary to, to create a sustainable society. Similarly, if you imagine a, a labor movement with, in the context of tight labor markets, I think it would be much more able to organize workers effectively, negotiate wages and benefits from a position of strength, 
and in general advance an agenda that would uh, design to decrease economic inequality and spread society's wealth more fairly. I don't mean to suggest that, that uh, reducing immigration into the U.S. would guarantee any of this. Uh, my claim is that continued mass immigration will make achieving these liberal political goals impossible and that therefore reducing immigration should be part of a progressive political agenda going forward. So okay, you might ask if, if all this is true, why don't progressives typically support immigration reduction? Why is the AFL-CIO uh, arguing for passing bills that would increase immigration? Why is the Sierra Club and why are other environmental groups uh, often supporting this kind of legislation which would increase immigration? And I think the answers are complicated. Some of it just has to do with real politic, and, and we can talk about that uh, a little later. Some of it has to do with both the strengths and weaknesses of progressive political thinking in the U.S. today. So on the positive side, progressives, I think, are compassionate. We care about people, whether or not they're our fellow citizens. We see would-be immigrants who want nothing better to come to this country and make a better life for themselves and their families, and we just naturally want to help them and not stand in their way. Beyond that, uh, it seems as if most progressives feel guilty about any policies that smack of selfishness. So one environmentalist I interviewed for my book, uh, and, and he argued for reducing immigration and, and strongly um, enforcing our, our immigration laws, but he still had the following remark. The fact that I was fortunate enough to have been born on the north side of the border and other people were unfortunate enough to have been born on the south side strikes me as unfair, just a stroke of luck. It's just arbitrary, he said. Uh, another environmentalist said, my great-grandparents were immigrants, and I feel hypocritical saying to other people, you shouldn't be here. And I heard a lot of those kind of comments from, from progressives in writing the book. So that's, I think, the positive side of progressives' reluctance to limit immigration, our soft-heartedness. And then on the negative side, there's our, our soft-headedness. I think progressives share Americans' general inability to think clearly about limits, whether those are limits to how much we can improve the world or limits to how many people our landscape can support. So for instance, in the face of increasing water scare scarcity in California, uh, most environmentalists there naturally look to technological or managerial fixes rather than considering whether their state is simply full up of people. And the result is that over the past 40 years, Californians have, have used a wide range of efficiency improvements to create a much more crowded and less livable state, and one that I think is farther away from real ecological sustainability than, than it was 40 years ago. So we had the idea that we were doing something good, being more efficient in our resource use, but you have to decide what you're going to use that efficiency for. You can, you can use it to build a more livable society. You can use it to keep a little bit more water and, and landscape for other plants and animals. Or you could just fill it up with more people. And that's what California has chosen to do. That's what California is still choosing to do. Uh, similarly, progressive politicians pin their hopes for re reversing growing economic inequality on a range of good policy proposals from a more progressive uh, uh, income tax structure to a higher minimum wage, while basically ignoring the role flooded labor markets play in driving up inequality, and also undermining the, so the role that, that immigration plays in undermining the social cohesion necessary to, to pass some of their favored policies. This is something that Michael's talked about in, in his work. So essentially, progressives accept mass immigration's negative economic impacts as a given, and against all the evidence, they assume that they'll be able to enact redistributive policies strong enough to move society in a more egalitarian direction, despite the drag that that exerts, uh, that's exerted by our immigration policies. I think these views are profoundly unrealistic, but they allow progressives to avoid considering hard choices and trade-offs. And they're facilitated by how immigration is typically framed in the public sphere. So it's rare to see people in the media connecting the dots between immigration levels and U.S. population growth, between population growth and our impacts on the natural environment. 
In recent years, it's been a little bit more, you're a little bit more likely to see people connecting the dots between mass immigration and stagnating wages and declining employment opportunities for poor Americans, and that's actually good to see. But one reason I wrote my book was to just bring these kind of arguments to the forefront and, and try to present them in a way that progressives could, could understand and, and maybe appreciate.